Hello, I'm Mel Nathan. I'm Guy Three from Menon. Welcome. Welcome to Med News Week Conference, where we feature presentations by Medicine's Global Leaders. Today, we have an amazing keynote speaker in Dr. Matthew Madison. Dr. Madison is the Chief of the Division of Blood Disorders at Rutgers Health. In today's presentation, Dr. Madison discusses the latest updates in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Did you know that Dr. Madison is a globally recognized oncologist and leader who has led more than 30 clinical trials that have led to FDA drug approvals? He's also the former medical director of Memorial Sloan Kettering's Bergen branch and the recipient of multiple national awards, including the Hematology Attending Teaching Award at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and the John J. Kenny Award from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. He's a dedicated advocate and leader in the field of oncology and clinical trials. So let's tune in. Let's tune in and learn from this great global leader. So I've, I've parenthetically mentioned polituzumab a couple of times this evening with you, and the results of the attempt to incorporate polituzumab in this CD79B targeting antibody drug conjugate, uh, reported in the Polarix trial, um, which I was proud to, to be a participant. Now, POLA, just by way of level setting with you guys, is indeed an antibody drug conjugate. It binds to CD79B, which is ubiquitously expressed on the surface of malignant B cells. Attached to this antibody is MMAE, monomorphic E. Um, this is an antitubulin agent, so it binds, it's internalized by the cell, releases MMAE intracellularly, leading to microtubule disruption and subsequent apoptosis. And we had single arm phase two data to show that incorporating polituzumab um, uh, into a CHP, not CHOP, because POLA and vancristine are quite similar in terms of toxicities, but substituting POLA for vancristine seemed to have been safe and effective in newly diagnosed large cell lymphoma. So on the basis of that, we conducted a globally conducted double-blinded randomized trial for patients with newly diagnosed large cell lymphoma over the age of 18, IPI2 or greater, and randomized them to receive our CHP and either POLA and a Vinca sub placebo or Vinca and a POLA placebo. Everybody got six cycles of chemo. Everybody again got two extra cycles of rituximab to satisfy European regulatory concerns. And what did we see? So the study was powered to, to detect a primary endpoint of progression free survival and the secondary safety endpoints, as you see here. We did a good job randomizing patients. This is over 800 patients that were treated on this trial around the world. And the arms were very well balanced, I would say, for all of the relevant clinical factors, including stage, IPI, cell origin, expression of beta BCL2. You'll note the bottom line here, double or triple hit these patients who have rearrangement of MYC with either BCL2 or BCL6. This is an older nomenclature, but even so, there were very few patients like that in the study, limiting our ability to draw conclusions for that uh, disease state from this trial. But what did we learn from Polarix? We see that this was the first prospectively conducted positive randomized trial in the RCHOP era. And it met its primary endpoint of improvement in progression free survival for the polar RCHIP uh, patients compared to RCHOP alone. Has ratio 0.73, a 27% risk reduction, an absolute 24 month PFS benefit of 6.5% compared to RCHOP alone. So you say it's a modest clinical benefit, but real and measurable and just as we power it. What about overall response? Again, overall response was very high in both groups as you would, as you would expect. Um, Disease-free survival curves parallel those of the progression-free survival curves, which is always reassuring to see in such studies. Importantly, we do not yet see an overall survival benefit for the polio treated patients compared to RCHOP alone. The median follow-up is still relatively early. We have certainly improved treatments for patients with relapsed large cell lymphoma. Whether there will ever be a survival benefit detected or not remains a very open question. But at very least, we see that we can improve progression-free survival in these patients. So then you have to ask the question, well, if you're only improving progression-free survival, do you really need to give it to everybody? And this is where people like to perseverate over subgroup analyses. And remember, please, I always say when I show this slide that you have to take with a grain of salt. 
this, these are all post hoc unplanned analyses. These were not powered studies. We spent no alpha on this work. This is all just trying to get a feel of if there might be signal here. What do we see? There's a couple of things that are worth talking about here. The first is the very bottom double, triple hit lymphoma. I already said there were, there were too few patients to draw any meaningful conclusions here. Certainly you couldn't look at the results of Polaris and say Polar chip is uh, the new standard of care for patients with high grade lymphoma. We can draw no meaningful conclusions, yay or nay. The two other categories here, well, I'll say three. The fourth from the top, you'll see IPI score. In IPI two, uh, your little box whiskers is centered right around one. IPI three to five skewed increasingly towards polar R chip. And this is a theme that we often see in trials in aggressive lymphomas, which is that the higher the risk of the disease, the easier it is to detect an incremental benefit. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a common lesson in this space. It's impressive that we were able to see a benefit at all when we included the overall patient population of two to five. Many trials are written only allowing IPI three to five for this very phenomenon. So that's uh, noteworthy in my opinion. The one below that bulky disease, absent or present, you see that the absence of bulk strongly favored polar R chip, whereas bulky patients uh, did not seem to derive as much benefit. That's biologically plausible to me. We know that antibody for conjugates in many contexts may be less efficacious in patients with bulky disease due to difficulty in delivering that chunky antibody for conjugate into the center of the bulk uh, site of bulk. So that's credible. Um, the third from the bottom is the one that causes the most strife right now, and that's the cell of origin work. And you'll see that in this unplanned postdoc unpowered analysis that the germinal center patients didn't seem to derive much benefit. The activated B cell patients derived outsized benefit. And what do you do with this? Do you look at this and say, well, I'm only going to offer this to ABC patients? Do you say this is postdoc and I treat according to the protocol, and if they're eligible, they're eligible? Um, I, I personally espouse the latter principle because of its postdoc nature. When you look at the other studies that have been conducted, looking at polytuzumab and large cell lymphoma, it has not been a consistent and clear message that there's differential activity by cell of origin. Um, so I think that this remains an area of interest and of uncertainty uh, and certainly will be looked at in future studies. So I've said that there's a progression free survival benefit, no overall survival benefit. So what do you get for that? And certainly there are times where we have a PFS benefit without OS benefit. And we say, is it worth the trade-off? You have a drug that's much more toxic, for instance, but gives you a little bit of PFS benefit. That's a judgment call. Here, I would say that the toxicity profile of polar R chip compared to RCHOP is really very similar in terms of overall adverse events, in terms of frequency of high grade adverse events, in terms of drug discontinuation um, or dropping the dose of, of the study drug Polo or Vinca, uh, or overall dose reductions of any study drug, the two arms are really identical, uh, affirming that Polo R chip is really no incremental toxicity cost over R chop alone. So our conclusions were that the Polaris regimen of Polo R chip does indeed significantly prolonged PFS compared to RCHOP alone, and it does so with a toxicity profile similar to that of RCHOP uh, standard of care, uh, supporting the use of polar RCHOP in the initial treatment of patients with large cell lymphoma. This has now gone on to receive uh, FDA approval in the United States for this indication. Admittedly, this is not gonna be a global solution, and this is a global audience this evening. So every health system is gonna have to decide how it's gonna spend its shekels and um, there's no doubt that cost-benefit analyses uh, looking at the impact of polituzumab in the first line need to be performed within the context of each health system. Uh, we look forward to reporting our cost-benefit analysis uh, looking at the Polarx regimen, so stay tuned for future manuscripts and congresses. Um, but, um, but that work is done in the context of U.S. health payers and the U.S. health payer mix. Every health system is going to have to make these choices in terms of the cost benefit analysis um, in that specific uh, context. So, what does the future possibly hold? How are we going to move beyond even Remodel B or, or Polarix? So, the first thing I'll say there is to look back to the past 
and to call one of those prior negative studies, that being the Phoenix trial, which was a randomized trial of RCHOP plus or minus ibrutinib. And this was a randomized uh, double-blinded study looking at patients with activated B-cell large cell lymphoma, the subtype that should be uh, influenced by ibrutinib. And this study, as I've already said, was a negative study. No improvement in its primary endpoint of eventual survival, either at, by intention to treat or when you actually peel off the specific ABC patients. However, when you look further and you look by age, we see that younger patients treated with r plus ibrutinib actually had significantly improved outcomes compared to older patients who actually had slightly inferior outcomes with ibrutinib. When you break that down into EFS and OS, if you look at the younger patients treated on the Phoenix trial, there actually was an improvement, not just in EFS, but in overall survival for the ibrutinib, including patients um, under the age of 60. This was unplanned post-hoc analysis. This is not and should not be the standard of care, but it's highly provocative. And this is a good example of what you do with these post-hoc analysis. I mean, wow, we, maybe we have a real signal here in younger patients, including BTKs. You say, well, why would that be? It looks to me like a lot of that, perhaps not all of it, but a lot of that is driven by tolerability. And we know that adding a BTK inhibitor to RCHOP does add toxicity, but that seems to be outsized phenomenon in older patients, more myelosuppression, more infections, more drug uh, disruption, more treatment discontinuation, more dose reduction. So if you're delivering less treatment, even though you have a BTK in there, you're not going to be having as positive an impact. Whereas in younger patients who tolerate the combination more consistently, you can have more reliable drug delivery and thus reap the putative benefit. So again, when you look by age, the, the outcomes really are quite striking. And the RTA plus in younger patients really does look excellent. What do you do with that? Well, we build the next study. And here, what we did is we built Escalade, which is a trial that um, I'm proud to be helping to lead, which is a globally conducting trial, taking patients with um, newly diagnosed large cell lymphoma, IPI2 or greater, limiting it by age to younger patients. We started at 65, we've gone up to 70 based on some additional analyses, but really excluding those older patients that seemed to be most sensitive to the toxicities of BTK incorporation. Everybody gets a cycle of RCHOP while we figure out their cell of origin. If they're proven to be activated B cell by molecular profiling, they're then randomized to get a calibrutinib or a placebo with the primary uh, endpoint of progression free survival. The study is ongoing, making good progress, and we hope to finish it hopefully within the next year and then allow the data to mature. Other opportunities include the incorporation of venetoclax, the BCL2 inhibitor, that's made waves both in the treatment of acute myelogenous leukemia and MDS, um, but also a useful drug in the treatment of certain forms of lymphoma, including CLL. Um, my uh, uh, participation here was helping to participate in the trial called Cavalli, which was a single arm trial incorporating venetoclax into an RCHOP program in patients with newly diagnosed large cell lymphoma. What we learned from Cavalli was that patients who had BCL2 positive disease, either by immunohistochemistry um, or by cytogenetics, but even IHC alone, it looks like the outcomes with patients treated with venetoclax were actually significantly better than they would have been with an age-matched cohort control uh, from a prior uh, large clinical trial called Goya. Whereas those who um, had uh, disease that did not express BCL2 seemed to derive no benefit from the incorporation of an epiclides. Why don't we do this then? Because again, we have toxicity challenges when you add drugs on top of our CHOP. Here we saw there was significant mild expression within, with some treatment related fatalities, unfortunately, um, but certainly difficult in delivering full dose of drug. Um, uh, with this venetoclax program. So we're trying to learn from our experiences and the next wave of this is incorporating the Polaris backbone as opposed to the RCHOP backbone and using a more attenuated format of venetoclax trying to not overdo it here 
taking patients, again, with newly diagnosed large cell lymphoma, immunosochemistry positive for BCL2, IPI2+, to see what we can achieve as we continue to try to iterate here and figure out how best to deliver venevoclax um, for BCL2 positive disease. Other approaches uh, that are very interesting and promising include incorporating immunotherapies, such as CAR T cell therapy. And the Zuma 12 study was reported um, at uh, not this past ASH, but two ashes ago, looking at using active capuchin cytolucil or axi cell as consolidative therapy. So patients who had high risk large cell lymphoma, they'd go and they'd be induced according to standard treatment. And then if they were um, subsequently eligible, either because they had a positive interim PET scan after two cycles of treatment, um, or perhaps if they were MRD positive at the end, would go on to receive consolidative CAR T cell therapy. And when you look at the patients in the Zuma 12 program, despite being high risk because of the, the suboptimal speed of response, um, we were able to get 40 patients through and able to get them axi cell. And those patients uh, at reporting time were doing phenomenally well in terms of responding to the CAR T therapy um, and even sustaining that response as shown here in terms of duration of response and progression free survival, overall survival still being excellent at this early follow up time as well. Challenges with active cell, of course, is that it's active cell and CAR T cell therapy in general, active capuchin cell particularly does confer significant risk of toxicity, including cytokine release syndrome, as well as neurological adverse events or so-called ICANs. And the rates of CRS and ICANs in Zuma 12 were substantial, highlighting the challenges with routinely applying CAR T cell therapy even for patients with relatively well debulked large cell lymphoma. Other approaches that are being pursued, there's a treatment program combining a CD19 naked antibody called tafacitimab in combination with lenalidomide, the immune modulatory drug. And TAFA plus LEN or TAFA-LEN was studied and subsequently approved in relapsed, or, uh, relapsed large cell lymphoma, uh, demonstrating high activity and durability in a subset of lower risk patients with relapsed large cell lymphoma. But because uh, it does have non-cross-resistant toxicity with RCHOP, it's interesting to explore the consideration of whether you could incorporate this tafalen doublet into first-line therapy. And this work has now been kicked off. We've seen that you can administer TAFA plus RCHOP or even tafalen plus RCHOP, as was done in this sort of uh, pilot randomized trial, demonstrating that Tafa Len RCHOP is actually not much more toxic, interestingly, than Tafa plus RCHOP, suggesting that it may indeed be feasible to try Tafa Len RCHOP in a randomized trial. We were able to, in that earlier study, to maintain dose density, which is always encouraging. So, because it was shown to be feasible, there is now uh, an ongoing study, again, taking uh, patients with newly diagnosed large cell lymphoma, here IPI 3 or greater and randomizing them to either RCHOP plus TAFLM um, or RCHOP plus placebos. Lastly, I, I, I do want to highlight the potential of bispecific antibodies in large cell lymphoma. Um, bispecific antibodies, for those that may not be fully aware, are constructed antibodies that have not just one binding site against um, whatever the malignant cell is, in this case, the malignant B cell targeting CD20, but have a second binding site targeting CD3, bringing over uh, T cell, creating an immune synapse, activating and leading to cell proliferation of the T cells and T cell mediated killing of the tumor cell. And there are a number of such biospecific antibodies that are ongoing clinical development, some of which are shown here epcritimab, mosanotuzumab, glofitimab being the closest uh, to approval. Mosanotuzumab, in fact, has achieved its FDA approval in the treatment of mostly relapsed follicular lymphoma. And we are eagerly awaiting um, consideration of FDA approval this calendar year for both epcritimab and glofitimab in the treatment of diffuse large B cell lymphoma uh, for patients with relapsed, uh, mostly relapsed disease. But because these drugs have such good activity and tolerability that is favorable in comparison to that of CAR T cell therapy, there are a number of ongoing efforts to incorporate one of these specific antibodies into treatment paradigms for patients with newly diagnosed large cell lymphoma, both fit or unfit patients. And you can see here, if you can think of a, a subset of patients with newly diagnosed large cell lymphoma 
somebody has already writ, write, writing or written or opened a study incorporating a positive antibody to attempt to improve outcomes in that subset of patients. So with all that as a very long, um, but hopefully abbreviated <laughs> tour through the data underlying treatment of patients with the star cell lymphoma, let's go back to our patient again, 46. Workup showed stage four disease, bilateral renal mass, and some liver mass, um, highly avid. We did a biopsy, showed activated B cell or non germinal center, some type of large cell lymphoma. How do we treat such a patient in the modern era? You certainly still could just give RCHOP times six, um, remains a standard of care. You could say this is an activated B cell patient. I'm going to send the molecular signatures, but on the basis of remodel B, I'm so enthusiastic about this post hoc analysis using the molecular signature as opposed to immunostic chemistry that I'm going to buy it and try to incorporate bortezomib. You could take the FDA approved approach of Polaris and say this is an ABC patient. Those are the patients that derive the most benefit. This patient has an IPI score of probably four, certainly eligible and appropriate for Polaris. You could try to put him on a clinical trial. You could try to get him uh, RCHOP plus or minus a calibrutinib on the Escalade study. And then you're going to be stuck in the same position we all are right now, talking about central nervous system prophylaxis. His CNS IPI score is very high. He has a high IPI. He has renal involvement. Everyone would be worried about this patient being at risk from CNS relapse. Uh, and we would have a, a discussion highlighting our ignorance, but talking about the pros and the cons of considering high-dose methotrexate as an attempt at prophylaxis. 